Hi, everybody. Thank you for choosing this talk. Um, if you are listening to this or if you're watching this, it's probably because either the words Vault or Kubernetes or the operator pattern caught your eye. So um, Vault and Kubernetes are not easy to manage, as I'm going to show you. At least it wasn't for us in, 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 uh, um, in our use case. Uh, and hopefully, you can learn the lessons that we learned uh, and the journey that we took to kind of automate Vault and Kubernetes end to end. So first of all, let me let me tell you what, where we started and where we were with the kind of challenges um, we were facing. We started using Kubernetes about three years ago, and Vault shortly after that because certainly like secret management in, in Kubernetes wasn't um, that well crafted, both in the, the platform and in our adoption itself. <clears throat> so Vault was was kind of a, a, a no brainer there. Uh, back then, it was, Kubernetes was 1.9 and Vault was 0.8 or 0.9, I believe. And back then, the recommendation was to run Vault as isolated as possible. In fact, the, the tooling for running it in Kubernetes was pretty much non-existent. So following the recommendation uh, from back then, we were running it on, on EC2 VMs. We're an uh, AWS shop, so you see there's a VPC there that's the network boundary. We have our Kubernetes uh, uh, cluster there talking to Vault. The production workloads are running with service account uh, identities. The Kubernetes auth backend had just been released for Vault. So uh, it was perfect timing because then we, we could automatically use that, that authentication uh, scheme. You see that there's a square there with um, SRE. That means that the, the SRE team was maintaining both the Vault configuration as well as the static secrets. And that might, might sound kind of scary, but I'll, I'll touch on that in a minute. The vault configuration was kind of split into two. One was the, the we were maintaining this with Terraform, by the way. The, um, the vault um, cluster itself, so the cloud resources that form the, the vault cluster, as well as the backend configurations, like uh, roles, policies, options, et cetera. And then the static secrets were managed separately. Uh, again, I'll explain why in a minute. We had abstracted out the, the per service configuration uh, enough so that for any new service that needed to be authenticated with Vault, all the service owner had to do was just add this single line uh, in, in this list. This list would be passed to a Terraform module that would uh, create everything that that, that service required, uh, 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 policy, uh, permissions, roles, et cetera. Um, then static secrets, uh, that was kind of a kind of a special use case. The Specific situation in this case was that uh, back then Vault UI was enterprise only and we were using open source. And uh, the KV backend for static secrets was only version one. So the problem was that modifying secrets that already are either appending keys or modifying existing secrets was kind of a hassle because you had to, first of all, you had to do it in the command line, you had to export it to a JSON file, modify it, reinject. It's kind of error prone, very manual. So what we ended up with was uh, this kind of pattern of encrypting plain text secrets offline with KMS and then storing that KMS in source control. The, the, the example that you're seeing there, the, uh, the string there is not the actual secrets, not the actual key, but it's rather the KMS encrypted version of it. So we, we put this in a Terraform where uh, we had a data source object that would decrypt that uh, on the fly and then a vault generic secret to inject that secret into vault. This was, um, obviously there's, there's kind of risks in, in doing this, but this was uh, mitigated by having the Terraform in-memory backend. Um, it's not actually like that documented, but you can use the, this in-memory backend with, with an empty block. And what it will do is that it'll have, um, the, the backend will still exist, but it will only exist in memory and only for the duration of the run. So there's no remote state where secrets are, are being persisted in, uh, in plain text. So what I just explained might sound like we have everything under control. So what was it really that we were trying to solve? It not, may not be clear. So first of all, the, the picture that I showed earlier, kind of, it's kind of oversimplified because it, it was showing a single cl a Kubernetes cluster, a single vault cluster, and a single uh, network boundary. But the reality is that we have um, a um, 
deployment model of multiple single tenant Kubernetes clusters, each of them with their corresponding vault cluster, and the configuration of all of them was pretty much identical. On top of that, we're having an explosion of multiple microservices, so modifying things meant modifying not just a single microservice in a single um, environment, it meant doing it in, in multiple places, multiple times for both configuration and secrets, and that's kind of getting out of control. Now, that usually wouldn't be a problem if we had some form of CI-CD for these changes, but we had none. So everything needed to be uh, applied manually by human, uh, and the S3 team was the bottleneck, so it was just only a few of us that, that could do this, and it was kind of getting to a point where it, it couldn't really scale. Uh, the other thing is that there was a uh, kind of a false sense of self-serviceness where people can, like service owners can just add that line of, uh, to indicate that they wanted their service to be authenticated and configured for Vault. Um, the reality is that that's where the interface stopped for, for service owners because uh, the PR approvals, the merges, the applies had to be done by the SRE, because, uh, the SRE team because um, there was a team that had permissions for the Terraform backend as well as permissions to Vault and to decrypt KMS. So it was, it was too coupled with the S3 team to be made actual self-service. The other thing is that Terraform only provides a point-in-time configuration, meaning that uh, it's accurate at the time you apply it and then you do the Terraform apply run, but we didn't really have good control in between uh, apply runs. E and even in the presence of CI-CD, um, that, that still didn't give us the, the continuous and automated um, um, control that we wanted to have. Before I go on, let me introduce myself briefly. Um, my name is Pato. I'm a lead SRE engineer for a company called ASAP. We're based in New York City in the World Trade Center, or at least we were up until six months ago. Uh, we built customer interaction platforms, and what that is is that uh, imagine when you're trying to call your bank or the ISP or airline or something, we want to transform that call into a digital interaction. So move it from one-on-one uh, -on -one calls to a, a, a multi-channel digital platform. And we want to throw in our special AI sauce. And AI, this is not uh, just a buzzword compliant artificial intelligence. It means augmented intelligence. We want to augment the human behind the call and not replace it with a bot. Right? Um, also, I was known around the office as the unofficial HashiCorp ambassador. Uh, until earlier this year that HashCorp uh, launched the official ambassador program, and I was nominated and selected, so I can cross off that, that, uh, those two first letters in the title. Okay, moving on. The, uh, you don't need to know a lot about Kubernetes other than the fact that it's a, a container orchestration platform, uh, but there's, and certainly we didn't know a lot about Kubernetes when we started doing this, so, but there's uh, two key aspects of Kubernetes that we discovered and explored and kind of... Uh, uh, guided the path that we took. One of them is the, the operator pattern. Kubernetes itself is kind of like one big controller running in a loop, reconciliating uh, stated or declared um, objects into real objects like pods and containers and things like that. So, but on top of that, you can run your own a custom layer of, uh, your layer of custom controllers that will reconcile custom resource definitions is another Kubernetes concept. What they are are basically just arbitrary data structures that define the, uh, the attributes and the state of things that you want to represent, whether things in your business domain, real world objects, a external APIs, etc. Uh, it's not limited to just Kubernetes API, so a controller does need to uh, uh, act only on Kubernetes objects. It certainly talks to the Kubernetes API, but it can integrate with external APIs. In our case, for example, we integrated it with the AWS API as well as the Vault uh, backend. And one of the ma major advantages here over the Terraform setup that we had is that this reduces the drift because it continuously ensures that the state is running as defined. It's more than just a glorified cron job Terraform apply uh, because it, it kind of merges all the APIs together as well as running, runs on, on, a, on a loop that uh, acts every uh, cron tick or every event to ensure that things are as you as you're uh, defining them. The other aspect of Kubernetes is admission controllers. Uh, they're essentially just webhooks that uh, intercept calls to the uh, Kubernetes API, whether from humans when you run kubectl apply or when machines are running, uh, for example, uh, uh, Jenkins or Spinnaker. 
uh, or other controllers are talking to the Kubernetes API, this webhooks intercept the, the requests. Uh, there are two types. One is the validating webhook uh, that simply just inspects the payload and either rejects the request or passes it on, or uh, uh, mutating webhook. Those inspect the, the payload and can modify it before passing it back and, and getting persisted in uh, Kubernetes storage, etcd, or whatever you have. The main use case for either one, well, for the validating webhooks, is to um, enforce rules or restrictions that go beyond just RBAC, whether a user or a role has permission to do this or not. And for the mutating webhooks, is you can sanitize uh, input or uh, modify things, uh, modify objects with things that are known at runtime, uh, but not previously known. So having said what I said about Vault, Kubernetes, and our usage of it, the struggles that we were uh, having, and this key aspects of, of uh, Kubernetes, it was obvious that the, that the solution was to just bring them together and uh, have them work in harmony. First of all, we wanted to leverage Kubernetes itself as the automation platform. Um, we, we still have the pipelines for deploying the things that we want to define, but then we want to have Kubernetes uh, modify the things as late as possible so that they don't have to be previously known or defined and they can be just injected by Kubernetes uh, at, at runtime or at schedule time. Our services were already using um, Kubernetes authentication, so it, it kind of, it didn't add a lot of benefit of, of pulling Vault in, but it removed a lot of the uh, risk or operational complexity of having to maintain the additional set of uh, EC2 um, instances. But uh, more importantly than this, we wanted to push ownership of, of configuration and secret man management to service teams. So we, we want to remove humans and remove the S3 team completely from the picture so that they can do this by themselves and not have to depend on an on, um, external team. So let me uh, paint a picture of what we kind of were looking at and what we ended up with. First of all, you see that that, that square represents Kubernetes. Now everything runs within Kubernetes. Uh, that kind of looks the same. We still have the workloads, uh, the, the pods, running with service count identities, using that to authenticate to Vault. But this is where things started to change. We have now a Vault operator that uh, is the one that's in charge of creating the Vault resources internally, the pods and services and all that. We have a, another operator that is in charge of uh, discovering identities that need to be configured for Vault authentication and uh, reconfigure Vault for that. We have uh, mutating webhooks that modify workloads so that they can discover uh, Vault or know what Vault to talk to. At that point, we have kind of almost a full circle of like, Vault creation, uh, something to configure, something to discover, but now we need the, the meat of the pie is the, the secrets that the services are gonna, are gonna read. So we're gonna explore them one at a time. Uh, we have the Vault creation, then Vault uh, configuration, or authentication configuration, sorry, and Vault discovery, as well as then secrets uh, uh, to consume. So let's start with the um, upper left. For the Vault operator, uh, we're using an open source operator uh, maintained by a company called Banzai Cloud. It's called Bank Vault. This essentially just installs a custom resource in your, um, in your cluster that's called Vault. It's a new kind. And you can define the state and the configuration of your uh, Vault cluster in that object. So that single object replaces the Terraform that we had for both the cloud resources as well as the configuration with a single object that will have everything. And on top of that has a kind of a programmatic interface that can be modified by other things. Why not use the official HashiCorp Helm chart, you might ask? So we evaluated it and it was good for day zero and maybe day one uh, with, with some additional, additional care. Uh, the, but the thing is that it only provided the baseline for creating the, the base infrastructure. So, and we weren't really looking to just have that, we're looking to add automation on top of that. Um, we already had a solution for creating Vault clusters. Granted, it was outside of uh, Vault, uh, Kubernetes, and that wasn't what we were looking for, but we we're looking to not just do that, but, but um, programmatically uh, uh, augment it. And it certainly wasn't good for, or at least in our case, for day two plus, because it, the, the Helm chart doesn't really help you in defining uh, uh, roles, policies, auth options, mounts, uh, etc. So it's not, it wasn't what we, what we wanted to do. So uh, the, the dynamic configuration operator. 
like I said, our services are using, or production workloads are using service account objects to use that identity to identify with Vault and exchange a JWT for a Vault token. Uh, so the operator, what is doing is discovering service accounts that need to be configured and add that configuration in. The, the key here is that the operator is not modifying Vault directly, but it's modifying the Vault object that was defined earlier, so that that's the central kind of operation point. Uh, and then the Vault operator takes those changes and actually makes the changes um, to the uh, API, to the backend. The behavior at runtime doesn't change because from the point of view of uh, the um, this service, it's still using some identity, it's still using uh, talking to some Vault and using the same flow to authenticate. What that looks like is, uh, so if you were discovering, uh, declaring your service account with like the first four lines, now you just need to add this one annotation that says, hey, I want you to auto configure me. And the effect of that is that now the Vault backend will have the, the, um, uh, the role policies and the config configuration for any service using this service account to be able to, to talk to it. And that's it, no human needs to be involved because everything happens programmatically uh, behind the scenes. And the mutating webhooks. Uh, the, the idea of the, the webhooks was to reduce the complexity to service owners by uh, removing the surface area of things they needed to know or, or modify. Uh, we wanted to avoid having like copy paste, uh, people having copy paste things, maybe they copied from previous uh, integrations that are not really uh, compatible anymore or they need to copy uh, a sidecar a definition, we wanted to remove that. Uh, and on top of that, the sidecar itself abstracts out the what I call the authentication dance if, of a service having to have the knowledge of what, what's the flow for using the Kubernetes specific authentication endpoint. And it can just go straight to requesting secrets and doesn't need to know about the rest. Because we know that sidecars are kind of controversial and we can talk about, about that uh, separately, we, we made this optional. Um, we, we hope that in the long run, that'll converge to the uh, doing the right, not the right thing, but doing the easy thing, made that the right thing to do. Uh, but we also wanted to give uh, teams that want to have more control and be more explicit about what, what they're doing, uh, the, the option to do that. So you can own your own Vault-related configuration and actually do that copy-paste and, and sidecar definition, or you can just say that, that declare your intention with uh, annotations, and the webhook will, will take over. What that looks like in a, in a in the real life is that, for example, I have my deployment definition and uh, I want to inject a sidecar there. I don't want to define the sidecar, I want the webhook to do it for me. I just add that annotation that says, hey, I want you to inject a sidecar into this deployment definition. And when that pod gets scheduled, um, the webhook is gonna intercept that call and inject that vault agent sidecar. Uh, that uh, sidecar definition is not declared uh, explicitly in the deployment manifest. In fact, if you do something like kubectl describe uh, deployment, you won't see it, but you'll see it if you do kubectl describe pod because it, it was injected just in time right before the pod got, got scheduled. If for services that, that are doing automatic, sorry, direct integration for Vault, they're not going through the sidecar, they can also request to uh, have the, the environment variables explicitly defined. Um, so there's another annotation there that says essentially, I want you to configure this container specifically to inject the values that will allow it to, to talk to, um, to Vault directly. So I just need to define my variables that I want filled in. And then at runtime, again, when that pod gets scheduled, by that point, the, the mutating webhook will inject the Vault address, the Vault CA, so these are examples, but also not just the value, but it will also mount the volume and discover the, uh, the uh, TS certificate that it needs. All these values are known by the webhook previously because it's pre-configured and that's where we abstract all the knowledge um, so that it, it, it's concentrated there, it doesn't need to be distributed uh, to humans. Uh, again, almost full circle, but now we need the thing that um, uh, services will consume. Uh, so we have this KMS vault operator, it's kind of the link between the, the flow that we were, I was describing earlier. Uh, it, it sort of follows a similar pattern to what we had before. Uh, the, the, now there's a new object kind, it's called KMS Vault Secret. It's, it's a custom resource and, and Kubernetes defined previously. And it again follows the same flow of we encrypt secrets offline with KMS, we store that in source control, it kind of becomes sort of secrets as code, because now you can, it's a, a 
Kubernetes object in YAML, you can embed it in your Helm charts or in your pipelines, however you do it. So operator discover, discovers those objects, uh, and then same thing, uh, reads the, the KMS string, decrypts in memory, injects uh, into vault. In practice, it looks like this, very similar to the, the uh, Terraform pattern we had before. You have, your, uh, the, the, you have the new object kind uh, called KMS Vault Secret. You have your, your path where your secret's gonna be created. You have a KV version uh, V1, for example, and then your keys and your encrypted secrets. Again, nothing leaves um, memory that's in plain text. And we come back to this. It's, uh, again, sort of the, 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 the part of creating Vault, configuring Vault, mutating workloads, and injecting secrets. And none of this requires a human other than, obviously, initial seed and, um, and creation. Piece of advice, by the way. Um, storing secrets in source control statically, even if they're encrypted, should be an exception. In our case, we had a very specific situation and a reason why we did it. Uh, but in reality, is you have Vault, and Vault can create dynamic secrets for you. Um, if you're generating secrets or credentials for you know, data stores like databases or console, Rabbit, etc., Vault can do that for you. If you're generating dynamic identities or, or role secrets for AWS IAM, GCP IAM, Azure roles, etc., that can be done for you as well. If you're using TLS certificates, Vault has a backend for that. There are cases, though, where you might have like private APIs. You, you can generate your secrets, rotate them, or generate them dynamically, but it's a private API or it's a non-standard operation, and uh, Vault obviously doesn't support that, but you can create, write a plugin for that. Uh, Vault has a plugin system that can be deployed in, in this same containerized Vault and Kubernetes way, um, and, and you can do that um, as well. Obviously, there's, there's the... Uh, balance of like maintaining that code uh, versus using something else. So it's, uh, it's, uh, there's, there's no rule of thumb, it's just like managing risk. Lastly, this wasn't really the goal of the project, but we realized as we were integrating it into the, the, the Kubernetes ecosystem is that there's a lot more things that we, can, we could use um, to enrich uh, the, the experience or, or, or the system of Vault and Kubernetes. For example, uh, my currently uh, favorite CNCF project is a, a open policy agent. If you're not familiar with it, go check it out, it's amazing. So we're using it for enforcing rules on um, secrets or configuration to prevent people from shooting those, themselves in the foot and us as well, make sure that we didn't have a incorrect configuration that could break the system. Monitoring and alerting with Prometheus was way easier now. We always had that option, but uh, having Vault running on EC2 made auto discovery very complicated. So now just create one object and things appear for us. Uh, if, for example, you're running Console Connect or Istio as your service meshes, they have direct support for Vault and you can just plug that into, into that uh, Vault that's running within the same environment and makes things uh, smoother. If you're using the Raft integrated storage, uh, and, and you're maintaining the, the, the external volumes, like EVS volumes, you can use one of these storage systems to uh, have your redundancy or your backups uh, in a sort of like more cloud-native way. And in general, just like check out cncf.io periodically for new projects or new things to add to your system to enrich it. For example, the, uh, um, the framework that was used for creating the operators that I mentioned earlier is the operator SDK framework that was recently added as a, as a CNCF project. Um, so it's always fun to, to check it out. So lastly, uh, there's some links. Uh, you don't need to write them down right now. You, you, you get this presentation. I just want to point out that the first three are the, the um, well, there's two operators and one webhook that, that are uh, open source for this. And by the way, they're also built for ARM architectures. So you can run that on Raspberry Pi Kubernetes clusters, such as this one that I have right here. Um, I also have a demo there that you can go check out, see, see this in, in, in action and in, in real life. And then uh, Bank Vault and some other projects that I mentioned in, in the talk. That's it. Thank you very much. Uh, this is where you can find me. Uh, feel free to tweet at me. I'm also on several Slack workspaces uh, on the CNCF one and the Kubernetes one. Um, just get in touch. And thank you very much. Mm -hmm.